Hi there, this is Dr. James Harrington, and this lecture is entitled Overdiagnosis, otherwise known as the art of diagnosing zebras. <laughs> and note that while this lecture primarily focuses on the harms associated with overdiagnosis, it is a companion lecture to the sociopath's guide to patient satisfaction, we'll say, which explores the side of medicine where we realize that we have a physician-patient relationship and we are judged based on, in part, the patient's impression of us and our service to them. So to some degree, we need to provide a sense that we have served them. And sometimes that means ordering a test that we know doesn't help us, but the public perception seems to be that that test is useful. So there's some art in trying to balance the risks of testing with patient satisfaction and everybody has uh, their own threshold for that. But I think it's an important discussion. Now, overdiagnosis is so common now that there are books in the public arena written to try to protect consumers from us. Now, there are many kinds of overdiagnosis. One is when we expand the definition of a disease to include non-clinically relevant forms of a disease, whether that be by shifting the diagnosis from a clinical definition to a laboratory one, or if that means making the diagnostic criteria we have more, quote, sensitive. Either way, this is probably best referred to as pseudo-disease. A patient has a disease by definition, even though they have none of the prognostic significance that's normally associated with that disease. There's something else called the lead time bias that is a critical part of overdiagnosis. This happens when you make the diagnosis earlier than could have been detected clinically and is commonly found in screening programs. So think of it this way. There are really four waypoints along the progression of any disease. The first is the biological, anatomical, physiological stage, where maybe there are only a few cells of cancer, or maybe just a few bacteria, or there's a small tear in a blood vessel wall. Okay, The defect is there, but if you don't have circulating microscopes, you'll never know that the disease has started. Now, most of these heal, they're fought off by the body, they go away on their own, and we never know about them. But some progress. <coughs> and this leads to the next waypoint, that of laboratory diagnosis. Your body has responded now, and now we can detect something by imaging or with laboratory studies that maybe we can't detect yet by clinical means. In this phase, we have to discuss test characteristics, which is another lecture entirely and maybe several, but in general, what are the sensitivities and specificities of the tests we're using? What are the predictive value, the likelihood ratios? What's the underlying population prevalence and how does this patient fit into that? Can we detect the disease is not the same as should we detect the disease? How many people will we falsely diagnose for every one that we catch? How many that we catch will do better because of early identification. The next step is clinical presentation. Now there has been enough havoc in your body that you begin developing abdominal pain or shortness of breath or chest or back pain or weakness. Now as a clinician, we're beginning to see that there's something wrong going on. Now, even so early in this process, it may be difficult to identify exactly what the problem is. Diseases like infective endocarditis often start out as a nonspecific flu-like illness. If we evaluated everybody with a flu-like illness for infective endocarditis, we would waste billions of dollars and lots and lots of time looking for a disease that very few people have. As the clinical presentation progresses, it tends to become more obvious. And at this point, when we do testing, we're no longer screening, but we're investigating a process. We have a clinical suspicion, 
and we're appropriately investigating. Lastly, at the end of this whole process, there is death. The disease overcomes your body and you become fertilizer. So this is the natural history of disease. Lead time bias happens when we institute a, quote, effective screening program and therefore extend the amount of time we know you have the disease, even though we don't necessarily have to change anything about the total duration that you have the disease. So even in the absence of an effective treatment, okay, it appears that you live longer simply because you live longer with the diagnosis. Let me explain. In a normal situation, a normal patient, before any effective screening, you have a healthy patient who then develops a disease. Okay. Eventually, he develops symptoms. Let's say in this case that after you develop symptoms, you live for three years and then die. Now, let's look back at this same patient, but now we develop an, a, a, an effective screening program. So we screen for the disease and we catch it two years before he develops clinical symptoms. He still goes on to live three years after the diagnosis or after clinical symptoms and then dies. But in this case, he lives five years after the diagnosis instead of three years, so we feel better. But both patients still lived seven years. They lived four years from the moment that that disease started until they developed clinical symptoms and three years then until they died. We just knew about one longer. Now, in the presence of an effective treatment, in particular, a treatment that actually makes a difference if the disease is diagnosed early, this may be useful. But often that's not the case. And the problem with this is that studies suggest that being diagnosed with a disease tends to worsen outcomes in general. For instance, being diagnosed even with something like hypertension, which in and of itself shouldn't cause many health problems, tends to result in more missed days of work and more doctor's visits throughout the year than somebody who may have hypertension but doesn't have a known diagnosis. So two people with high blood pressure and the one who's told they have hypertension does worse. Sometimes ignorance really is bliss. From our graphic earlier, this is the area where you find lead time bias. The real problem here is we don't know who has slowly progressive disease and who has very slowly progressive or non-progressive disease at the time of diagnosis. Because we don't want to miss anything, we tend to treat them all as fast diagnoses and often favor for aggressive treatment, even at the expense of the patient's health, even when there are risks involved with treatment, rather than opting for the possibility of potentially missing something. Now there's another bias called the length time bias. And length time bias has to do with the spectrum of disease. So it's a kind of spectrum bias. Some diseases are rapidly fatal. Others take years or maybe decades before they cause any morbidity at all, much less mortality. Screening tests tend to miss the rapidly developing diseases and are much more adept at identifying slowly progressive diseases. Think of it this way. If there was a cancer that sometimes kills victims within one month, but other times lasts five years, if you test for that cancer every January, then you'll miss 11 out of 12 people with a rapidly fatal cancer. But you'll catch everyone with the slowly growing cancer, who you would have caught in plenty of time if you had just waited for symptoms anyway. This means that you help very few people with the rapidly fatal cancer, and you diagnose lots of people who may have had cancer that would never have developed into anything anyway, leading to a high false positive rate for a very low true positive, or at least what I would call a significant true positive rate. A true positive rate in which those you catch are actually benefited by the treatment you have to offer.
Now, these, as you can tell, are typically applied to screening programs for long-term diseases, for chronic diseases, things like cancer. But the concept applies just as appropriately to more acute diseases. Consider appendicitis. There is very little evidence that an immediately diagnosed appendicitis fares any better than one diagnosed at 12 hours, for instance. Otherwise, at a 12-hour recheck. Now, there is some evidence saying that delayed operation to appendicitis is associated with worse outcomes. But the problem with this is, much like delayed diagnosis to a myocardial infarction, is that most of the studies here have some problem with spectrum bias. And older, sicker patients who are not able to give an adequate history or in whom it is difficult to obtain an adequate physical exam or a reliable physical exam, delay to operation does tend to make a difference. But in younger, healthier people who present well, there really isn't any evidence that a delay leads to worse outcomes because these studies don't tend to assess the different populations. So anyway, length time bias would suggest that sicker people with appendicitis tend to have more obvious disease and require more immediate treatment. Often our testing, like our clinical perception, is most unreliable in patients who otherwise appear well. Most clinicians have seen a patient who's had abdominal pain or back pain for weeks only to discover that they had appendicitis, presumably the whole time, and often these people fare well. Other examples of this include pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, and I would even argue acute MI. There are many, many stories of people with these diseases who on initial presentation have normal findings only to go on to develop them later, but often these are the more healthy patients who have milder disease. That said, sometimes they just present too early in the course and subsequently develop significant disease. There's a great example of this in one of the cases from the Bounce Back series in which a young boy presented with abdominal pain and the astute clinician caring for him picked up that he had some meningeal pain and so did a lumbar puncture. But the lumbar puncture was negative. He had six WBCs, but few enough that he didn't consider that this truly represented meningitis, particularly with probably a pretty low pretest probability. But the boy went on to develop strep pneumo meningitis, and if I recall correctly, died. The problem was is that it was so early in the disease that the test was unreliable. So the relevant bias here in the ED is spectrum bias. If we CT scan, every abdominal pain will identify 95% of all appendicitis cases, which is a good point to remember that CT scan isn't 100% sensitive for appendicitis and in particular in very early appendicitis, in those patients with nonspecific abdominal pain and a non-convincing exam. But even if we do this, how many people will we subject to radiation? Or how about all the incidental findings that we make because of the CT scans that then require a workup with their associated harms? The value of our workups depends on the probability that a patient is going to de develop a clinically significant disease. And that is usually dictated by the severity of illness at presentation. This is inherently what spectrum bias is, and it's a good reminder that not everything in medicine is black and white. We usually operate in shades of gray. Another factor in overdiagnosis is the risk of the evaluation itself. There are almost no tests that we run that don't come without some risk, whether the risk is directly related to the test, for instance, CT scans and radiation, or contrast, or a secondary result of the test, like further testing and treatment because of a false positive result, or perhaps a true positive result of a disease that never would have caused problems. There's always risk to simply beginning a diagnostic evaluation. And the worst part about this risk is that the risks of evaluation apply equally to all patients along a spectrum, well and sick alike. 
Put another way, the person with a severe headache and neck pain and fever and vomiting has the same risks of the diagnostic workup as a patient with a mild headache and no neck pain and no fever, right? If there is a 6% chance of a subsequent severe headache, they both get that 6% chance, which is a great trade-off in the patient who has meningitis, but sucks for the patient that doesn't have anything. Now, this has to be balanced with the benefits of diagnostic testing, which, remember, we just said tend to be more robust in patients who we already have a suspicion for disease than in those that we think a disease are unlikely. Think of it this way. If you have a pulmonary embolism and right heart strain, the risks of CT scanning are probably far smaller than the risks of subsequent heart failure, dysrhythmia, respiratory failure, exercise intolerance, all the morbidities associated with your disease. On the other hand, if you have a small peripheral PE with no right heart strain and no underlying condition causing that, which admittedly we don't know this without further workup, but we also don't really know if on a population perspective that would be beneficial, as I'm not sure we really know what conditions really predispose you with a high likelihood of developing a PE or a clinically significant PE, then you're exposed to all the risks of the CT scan, the diagnosis, and the therapy for your PE, so anticoagulation, with only a fraction of the benefit that that high-risk, large PE patient with the right heart strain gets. And this is one of the most important reasons that we need to be cautious about overdiagnosis. It leads to over-treatment. And all of the psychological, financial, and physical damage that is associated with that treatment. And this is not to mention the unfortunate problem of simple medical error. We are both individually and as a group imperfect and make mistakes. And some estimates suggest that the medical community represents one of the top five causes of death in the United States. We are a remarkably dangerous group. And remember, any time we make a significant diagnosis, we are exposing that patient to all the dangers of the treatments we offer. So what diseases do we commonly overdiagnose? And this is just a sample, but the Huffington Post in 2014 released an article on the five most overdiagnosed conditions. And I think this gives you a good sampling of the kinds of things we tend to overdiagnose. And admittedly, most of them are chronic. Chronic kidney disease. We found that we have many, many more diagnoses of chronic kidney disease, but no more dialysis and no more deaths from chronic kidney disease. And this came because of a change in the way we diagnose the disease. It was simply a change in our laboratory diagnosis, what we call chronic kidney disease. Pre-dementia. This is basically mild cognitive impairment, but it doesn't necessarily progress to Alzheimer's and there's no treatment. So the question is, are we helping or are we just scaring the hell out of old people? And like I mentioned early, there is some psychological effect of being diagnosed with something that in some respects becomes, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm not sure that by telling people they have pre-dementia, they're not more likely to go on and develop dementia-like symptoms because we've seen that progression in other diseases. Okay, overdiagnosis from overtesting. For instance, total body scan. This was put into the article because of the ubiquity of these total body scans and these big screening studies. This is kind of a lump category, but I think it's important to get us thinking about the notion of screening tests in general. The thought is, is that we do all of these big screening tests and we find these nodules that used to went unrecognized, mostly for our entire lives but those tend to require biopsy and then possibly resection. And overall, there turn, it turns out that there's a significant amount of morbidity and even some mortality from doing these tests. Now, the problem is sometimes you pick up a clinically relevant one. 
But how many people are going to suffer the ill effects from the medical community for every one that receives benefit? Now, the flip side of that in the other side of the coin lecture here is that I've seen lots of people who are more thankful for being hurt by the medical community because we tried than people who are upset by their overworkup. Our society tends to place a real stigma on, quote, missing a diagnosis. And we tend to be very thankful when doctors and the medical community invest their time and effort trying to diagnose and treat something, even if there's a bad outcome. So that creates a bit of a problem in how we go about dealing with patients. And it also gives some truth to the article that said when we have higher patient satisfaction scores, patients tend to do worse. And this is probably why, but that is a different lecture. Thyroid and prostate cancer. So there has been no change in mortality in thyroid and prostate cancer. And probably that's because we're increasingly diagnosing an extremely slow growing cancer that would never have caused problems, but now patients are getting lots and lots of biopsies and thyroidectomies and TERP procedures. Okay, they're becoming much more invested in the medical system, which once again is associated with lots of risk. And then lastly, low T. There's no proof that low T has anything to do with most of the problems that men are being treated for. It's kind of like the essential oils for men. A more emergency medicine perspective is on pulmonary emboli. Uh, in 1959, a guy named Barrett performed the only randomized control trial done to evaluate heparin in acute PE. And at that time, he found that the mortality for pulmonary embolism was 20%. One in five patients that they found to have a pulmonary embolism died. But when you look at most contemporary studies in the 2000s and 20 teens, the mortality is about 0.2%. That's one in 500. So how did we drop our mortality by a factor of 100? Well, that has to do with how we diagnose PE. And if you look at this on the bottom, this gives you an idea of how disease changes over time and how to tell if we have an effective treatment or if we're just screening and finding more non-significant disease. On the left, you can see a true increase in disease. We're finding more disease and the mortality is growing up. Our treatment hasn't changed, but there's more disease out there. In the middle, suggests we have an effective test and an effective treatment. We're fighting more disease and we're treating it, right? So the overall prevalence of disease goes up, but the mortality drops. And on the right, you can see overdiagnosis. The prevalence of disease rises, but the mortality stays the same. And if you look at the trends in pulmonary embolism, you can see here in the middle, there's the advent of the CT angiogram. And after this point, the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism doubles. But the mortality stays relatively the same. Now, it decreases slightly, but you can see there was no real change in the rate of decrease from before and after this, which suggests that there wasn't any new treatment. We're not really doing better. What we are doing is diagnosing significantly more. And any drop we're seeing in mortality is probably because we're diluting out all those sick pulmonary emboli patients with all of the well pulmonary emboli patients. Another example is heart attacks. Heart attacks tend to be one of these things that we argue a lot about because a lot of the cardiology literature would suggest that if we miss these, they have a very high mortality and there's really a 0% allowable miss rate. But when you look back at the history of MIs, first of all, the percentage of chest pain ruling in for MI in the 1950s to the 1980s was usually somewhere around 30%. It ranged anywhere from 25 to 40%. So lots and lots of people presenting to a hospital or being admitted to a hospital for chest pain ended up having an MI. Even as late as 1999, according to the CDC, the percentage of chest pain visits that resulted in a diagnosis of MI was 
We were still diagnosing one out of four chest pain patients with MI. By 2008, that number had overall dropped to 13%. Nowadays, most institutions report a less than 2% rule-in rate. So we are seeing lots and lots and lots of low-risk chest pain. Now let's compare that to the mortality of MIs. When you look at the mortality of MIs in the 1960s, this was also about 30%. By the 1980s, it had dropped to 15%. Most studies now suggest even lower rates. And why is this? Well, some of this probably has to do with how we're diagnosing MIs. You see, 30 and 40 years ago, we were diagnosing MIs as, quote, Q-wave infarctions. But nowadays, we know that by the time you see a Q-wave, there has already been significant, often irreversible damage. A Q-wave only happens after the ST elevation has come and gone. Furthermore, our lab testing has changed. Used to, we looked at things like the LDH and the CK and then the CKMB, and now we're using troponins and high-sensitivity troponins. We're finding things that used to we never would have found, which means possibly we're finding disease that would never have been diagnosed before and may not have the same clinical significance. The National Bureau of Economic Research published a study called Trends in Heart Attack Treatment and Outcomes from 1975 to 1995, and they did a literature review which compared the 25% mortality in 1975 to the 15% mortality in 1995. And their conclusion on why this was, was that part of the improvement was due to an increasing number of AMI patients being hospitalized, otherwise spectrum bias. There were more, quote, healthy AMIs in hospitals, which diluted down the percentage of deaths at 30 days. And part of the improvement was because of the increasing diagnosis of mild AMIs because of technology. AMIs that maybe didn't show up on an EKG, but did show up on a chemistry. Another example of this is pediatric UTI. Now, this is usually included in the term serious bacterial infection in studies that look at causes of fever in children. But there's not really a great deal of proof to support this inclusion into that category. In fact, a lot of the evidence goes to the contrary. For instance, when they've done studies on children with signs and symptoms of a respiratory infection, a cough, congestion, runny nose, and they look at their urine, about the same percentage of children with URI symptoms has bacteria in their urine as kids without. Now, you can take this one of two ways. One would be to say that these kids have a concurrent urinary tract infection. The other is, is that this is contaminant. This is bacteria. It's a false positive. Yes, they have bacteria, but this is not necessarily the infection that's causing the fever. If you listen to some of the intellectual greats in the field of emergency medicine, like Jerry Hoffman from EM Abstracts, then you've been hearing this for years that just finding bacteria in the urine and maybe a little leukocyte esterase probably doesn't belong in the same category as something like pediatric meningitis or pediatric pneumonia. Now, the argument that's always been given for why we should care about pediatric urinary tract infections is because it can cause renal scarring. And this can lead to hypertension and preeclampsia down the line. But most of the really good studies on this show at most maybe a several point increase in blood pressure. And we're talking numbers like they have the difference from 132 systolic to 136, with no real evidence of a clinically relevant endpoint. Furthermore, according to Campbell Wash Urology, the urology textbook, some research suggests that anti-inflammatories reduce renal scarring which means if your child has a fever and you give them anti-inflammatories, at least theoretically, you're reducing the chance of this. And that's independent of antibiotics. So I think this is another case of a disease that at least possibly we are over-diagnosing. And certainly we don't have the research to support 
a firm position on this. Now, there are several other diseases that I think we're all aware of that also fall into this category. Things like uh, high cholesterol, this notion of prediabetes, fibromyalgia. These are all diseases that are diagnosed increasingly frequently, but we don't really understand what the prognosis is for most of these. And most of the studies that try to look at prognosis suffer from a great many methodological flaws that more or less render their results useless. So what do we need to be thinking about? One important question we need to consider when discussing diagnosis is what exactly are we looking for? Now, while nobody would argue that we need to diagnose things like aortic dissections because they commonly result in significant morbidity and mortality, what about a type B dissection that's found two weeks after the first presentation for abdominal pain with no sequela? Let's say the person has equal pulses in all four extremities, normal kidney function, a non-surgical abdominal exam. Was that a significant miss? On the one hand, you missed an aortic dissection, but on the other, there weren't really any problems from that. And to look at it another way, what if you would have caught it initially? What if medical intervention would have subsequently caused problems? Would it be better to catch more things earlier at the risk of medical intervention causing problems or better to diagnose more later? Of course, running the risk of a natural deterioration. In regards to emergency medicine, even if that dissection carried the risk of deterioration, it was an emergency at the initial visit if they had normal pulses, and no kidney damage, no evidence of a threat to life or limb at the moment. It may have been an urgency, but not an emergency. And furthermore, what would a cardiovascular surgeon have done? Most of the time, it's medical management unless they develop something else. So the question really here is, are we trying to make diagnoses or are we trying to identify emergencies out of emergency departments? How about things like a uh, saddle PE? What if it had been misdiagnosed as a pneumonia a week or two before? Should we really be looking for PEs in well-appearing patients with normal heart rates? Nowadays, we can do bedside ultrasounds. If they have a normal-appearing uh, right ventricle with no evidence of right ventricular strain. Saddle PE sounds bad, but is it truly an emergency if it is not causing decompensation? I don't know that we know the answers to this. How about a headache that was misdiagnosed as a migraine, but subsequently found when the patient was asymptomatic to be an intracranial bleed? These are all actual patients, and they all ended up getting workups and treatments, but none of them had real objective signs of distress during the clinical presentation where they were diagnosed. This is the point at which, if we're going to be honest with ourselves as a medical community, I think we need to be asking, in these patients, what are the risks of further investigation and treatment versus the benefits we have to offer? We're talking about patients who are well-appearing with normal vital signs and normal exams. These problems also raise questions about the history and physical. While these are commonly denigrated, if a patient has an excellent clinical appearance and a normal physical exam, what does this say about the risk of deterioration? Certainly all of us have seen patients deteriorate before our eyes, but I don't think we reflect on the patients who look well and get treatment and subsequently deteriorate because of our intervention. And I don't know that we're as aware of how often each of those happens. Furthermore, does the history and physical routinely miss elements that would otherwise be picked up on testing? particularly in regards to prognosis rather than diagnosis. If you remember from earlier, when we talked about the bounce back series, about the boy uh, who presented with abdominal pain, was found to have some neck stiffness, had a lumbar puncture done, and the lumbar puncture was really negative by uh, modern guidelines uh, for what constitutes a positive lumbar puncture. Remember, the physical exam was about as useful as the lumbar puncture. Both were equivocal. So the exam actually, or the, the testing actually didn't offer anything that the clinician found on his clinical exam uh, 
uh, without the test. So ultimately, the outcome wouldn't have changed despite the test, even by modern standards, because it was a negative test. And this goes back to that spectrum bias. At the moment that clinician saw that boy, there was not an emergency. Now, you could argue it was very, very early. And like we talked about earlier, there's this progression of disease from the first moments that there are a few bacterial cells in that boy's spinal canal to the moment we could detect something on lab to the moment he develops clinical symptoms. But the problem is, if you're assessing that boy right at the moment that it's starting to shift to a laboratory diagnosis, it's really hit or miss whether or not you're actually going to be able to make a diagnosis. So ultimately, we can give some idea of risk. I'm concerned your you know, son's neck is stiff. I'd like to you know, watch him for longer or look for these signs. But even so, you can't admit every kid that comes in with belly pain whose neck is a little stiff. You'd admit every flu case. You'd admit half the strep cases. Okay, we see this all the time. So this is part of the problem in trying to decide what are we really looking for. So how do we approach rare diseases or rare presentations of common diseases? How do we deal with hunting for zebras? So one of the masters of the case study was this guy, Bill Clinton. When he was running for office, he frequently used what we'll call in medicine case studies to make points to push his agenda. Mrs. Smith was a 74-year-old woman who lost her house because of certain policies in place and we need to change those, right? You know, Mr. Jones was a 45-year-old with AIDS who lost his insurance and, uh, you know, died of easily treatable AIDS-related complications, that kind of things. The problem with case studies, though, is they don't necessarily represent the population at large. They only have to be that one person, but psychologically, they really stick with us, much more so than statistics which are cold and mathematical. So they can be very misleading, even though they're very powerful. And they can create bias that encourages us to act in inappropriate ways. To some degree, bounce backs do the same thing. The bounce back series can make a very, if you read through that series, which it's a great series, it, it can scare you into overworking certain chief complaints when that's not really the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is to do a good history and a good physical and have a good differential diagnosis. But if you're not careful, you can be led into overworking all of these because you don't want to miss that outcome. You don't want to miss that diagnosis. I know from personal experience, when you see bounce backs in your emergency room, it's terrifying, most often because you think, God, I would have missed that too. And I think that terror can, once again, bias you to act in inappropriate ways. So what biases do we operate under and what heuristics do we use to try to help us when considering rare diseases? Well, the most common is the availability bias or the availability heuristic. Now, this was initially popularized by Tversky and Kahneman, who, if I recall, were uh, Israeli statisticians or economists who looked into human behavior and biases. And the availability bias is kind of the umbrella term over several other things. And this happens when one estimates the frequency or probability of a certain event by the ease with which instances or associations come to mind. And this can be a useful tool when used appropriately. So examples that are common or recent come to mind more readily and therefore have a greater availability. This is the notion behind if you hear hoofbeats, think horses. So mid-flu season, if someone comes in with a headache and fever and nausea and nasal congestion, you think flu, not meningitis. But this can be a bias when it causes us to overestimate the probability of a disease simply because an example comes to mind more readily. That is, we give it more importance because it's easier to think of, even if it doesn't fully explain the symptoms. And that causes premature closure. And we'll talk about that in a minute. 
underneath that umbrella is something called saliency bias. This is a source of availability bias, and it occurs when people are evaluating a low probability but a high impact event, like a pediatric stroke. This occurs when dramatic events, whether it be an emotionally devastating case or a case resulting in a prolonged lawsuit, affect our decision making to the exclusion of objective evaluation of the odds. Saliency bias is something that is memorable, like a zombie being shot in the head. Other errors in diagnosis. There's this dichotomy, usually between emergency medicine and family medicine, of the rule out worst first versus frequency gambling. In emergency medicine, we tend to operate under the rule out worst first scenario. Now certainly for high risk complaints and high risk populations, that's very appropriate. In the 70 year old with known heart disease and chest pain, it is absolutely our obligation to rule out a major coronary event. But should this rule out worst first scenario always be the method under which we operate? I think sometimes frequency gambling may be appropriate, even in an emergency setting, for instance, in rare diseases with an equivocal presentation. This is the purpose of the bounce back. If you're really concerned, or if the patient has a long drive or some inability to return, these may be the patients you want to place in observation, just to keep an eye on. After all, if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras, until you have reason to think zebras. Now, what other sources of diagnostic error do we need to consider when considering rare diagnoses? Well, first, faulty triggering. We should be considering some rare diagnosis. Probably not the 1 in 10 million rare diagnosis, but the 1 in 100,000, the 1 in 200,000, probably should at least fly through our mind for a moment. But we should have a higher threshold for testing in these, right? Remember, triggering is basically when you see or hear something and it it increases your suspicion for a disease. Imagine each of these stars being this diagnostic waypoint on our kind of diagnostic decision-making tree. And each time we see one, it bumps up our suspicion for the disease we're looking for. Well, if we only get to the first two and really don't find anything else, then our suspicion for that disease should appropriately fall off. We should not meet a diagnosis threshold, certainly not a treatment th or a, a testing threshold. But say we do get to four of these and we're nearing this diagnostic threshold. It's a disease they could have, but it's a very unlikely disease. These are the patients in whom we should be ordering tests. These are the patients where you get your probability somewhere in the 50-50 range or maybe the 20-80 range. But enough where a positive test will move you in a direction where you can feel more comfortable with your diagnosis. An example of triggering is in the diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage. These are some likelihood ratios of some clinical findings that should help to move your probability. Things like neck stiffness has a likelihood ratio of about six, which is good, but not great. Because if you know anything about likelihood ratios, a likelihood ratio of less than 0.1 more or less helps rule out a disease. A likelihood ratio of greater than 10 more or less helps rule in a disease. Anything in between does significantly less. Now, six is getting close, so we have a decent positive likelihood ratio, but by no means does this rule in subarachnoid hemorrhage. On the other side of this, things like arrival by ambulance decrease the likelihood by about half. Now, this is suspicious because you have to wonder what kind of study established this. It's an odd finding, right? But things like no complaint of neck stiffness or pain give you a likelihood ratio of about 0.5. So you're less likely, but not dramatically so, of having a subarachnoid hemorrhage. To throw this into probabilities, 
Say if you started with a pretest probability of 1%, I think it's unlikely you have the disease, but one out of 100 people who look like you would end up with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. If you came in and had a sudden onset exploding occipital headache that began during exercise, was associated with photophobia, and you had no history of headaches. That gets you to a post-test probability of about 10%. Maybe 15%. If you had neck stiffness, now you're up to 40%. Assuming that all of these things are independent, which they may not be, but at the most, you're talking about 40%. Now drop your pretest probability down to 1 in 10,000, or 0.01%. Now, given all the same things, you now have a post-test probability of 0.1%, one in a thousand. So you didn't really do a whole lot of good for yourself, even with a pretty convincing story. But that's because your pretest probability was almost nothing. Now, understandably, your pretest probability would probably never be that low in a patient with all those findings. But it does give you some idea about how diagnostic tests and clinical history help to move your probability. This is important because it helps us balance the risk of a disease with the risk of evaluation, and in the case of a subarachnoid hemorrhage, the risk of radiation from a CT scan. Other ways that we can make diagnostic errors in this situation are in data gathering and processing. One of the reasons we don't trigger appropriately is that we fail to gather the appropriate information. So we may miss strokes because we don't check visual fields, or we don't listen for dysphagia, maybe subtle dysphagia. We don't carefully evaluate gait or movement. We don't, don't check for extinction. We may miss epidural abscesses because we don't check reflexes or rectal tone or post-void residual volume. Right? We fail to gather the requisite information to make some of these difficult diagnoses that otherwise would have tipped us off. And when you look at medical legal cases, most of the time, although not always, the problem is because an accurate history and physical were not obtained. Okay, either because the provider anchored on a previous diagnosis and just went with it, or because of premature closure. Another way we make diagnostic error is the inappropriate interpretation of information. And this is rarely because we ordered an ESR, found it to be elevated, and then decided to forego the MRI in the patient with severe midline back pain. More often, this is our failure to recognize the limitations of tests. For instance, the impotence of the WBC or the imperfect sensitivity of a CT scan for appendicitis. But sometimes this can include simple misses. Sometimes because of the frantic pace of modern medicine, or sometimes because we just didn't know what the test meant. Uh, for instance, a positive blood on urine dipstick, but no RBCs on microscopic examination. In conjunction with inappropriate gathering and processing of data, this also concludes pro uh, includes problems like ordering a D-dimer in a patient at high risk for pulmonary emboli. Remember, if the prior probability is already 40%, then a negative D-dimer doesn't actually help you all that much. You gathered unnecessary information by ordering the wrong test and then misinterpreted the result to mean that the search is off. In a high pretest probability patient, they get a CT scan. On the other side of the coin, if you order a D-dimer in every patient with dyspnea, then your bias affects you by erroneously expanding your search. You're ordering a test inappropriately and then inappropriately interpreting a positive result to mean all of these low-risk people actually require further evaluation when you never should have ordered the test in the first place. Lastly, you'll talk about verification error. This is basically premature closure before sufficient evaluation. And this is the most common cognitive-based error in diagnosing rare diseases. We look to verify what we think the patient had when they first walked in and we're unwilling to reconsider our diagnoses. Lastly, there's the no-fault error. It's just a misstep. It's a misdiagnosis. And once again, in rare diseases, in uncommon diseases, this should be expected because unless somebody comes in with classic signs and symptoms of a rare disease, the pretest probability in conjunction with a, an equivocal history and physical means that we should never reach a testing threshold on most of these people.
certainly not until they develop more convincing signs and symptoms. That leads us to the notion of beyond diagnosis. This was a article in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2008 by a guy named Andrew Vickers. In it, he said, don't diagnose until you are certain and even then realize the limitations of diagnosis, particularly in things like hypertension and cancer. Remember, just because we diagnose those based on numbers doesn't necessarily mean everything about the patient's prognosis. Even in diseases where we have a pretty well-established idea of prognosis, say 15% of people go on to develop heart attacks, that just gives you a general idea of if you have a whole population of people with that disease, that certain number will go on to develop an adverse outcome. You still have to look at the patient in front of you and try to make an educated guess, really, about what their risk of having a bad outcome is. Other things that we see more in the emergency department are things like chest pain. Certainly, we can't diagnose most disease uh, diseases involving chest pain out of the emergency department. Aortic dissection is a rare diagnosis. And certainly if we see that on a CT scan, we can make the diagnosis, but much, much more often than not, we don't know the etiology. Now we may suspect that they have costochondritis, but we can't prove that. So really our chest pains need to be chest pain unknown cause because even if we suspect something, we certainly don't know it. Similarly, when you look at things like abdominal pain, even more commonly, we don't know the cause. So once again, I think it's wise and it behooves us to have a very vague and general diagnosis rather than something specific. In the article, Vickers mentions that we should really consider risk prediction instead of diagnosis. For instance, instead of chest pain, we need to consider the likelihood of a bad outcome from their complaint. And there really isn't a lot of research on this, but I think it's something important for us to consider, particularly moving forward as a field. People may not care as much if they've had a heart attack if they had a 1% chance rather than a 20% chance of going on to die in the next 30 days. Whereas I think with heart attack, people's estimates of their 30-day mortality are really all over the board. And for us, I think we need to document our, prob our estimate of their probability of deterioration. The other thing that's helpful uh, in these situations is follow-up. Stay in touch with your patients or make sure your patients have follow-up. Remember, most rare diseases are not diagnosed on the first visit to a healthcare provider. They're very, very often diagnosed after two, three, or four visits. And so follow-up with the medical community is very important. Overall, sometimes the right thing to do is let the zebra get away, at least the first time. This is what bounce backs are for. If you're diagnosing every zebra that comes across your clinic or emergency room, then you're working up too many people. Not everybody needs the house MD workup. As with most things in medicine, make sure you take an effective history. You do an adequate physical exam for the complaint you consider as broad of a differential as you can and keep an open mind about the possibilities until the patient's story and exam shift the odds in a particular direction. Try to keep yourself and your biases out of the encounter as much as possible. Our job is difficult and often not black and white. Very rarely are there definite answers. We need to get better about recognizing the shades of gray, and most importantly, do not judge. This includes your colleagues, your subordinates, medical students, mid-levels, nurses, techs, everyone. We all do the best we can, and I suspect most of us will find that across our careers, we will practice very different medicine, often practicing one decade, what would have been considered malpractice the decade before. I know we all love clinching that difficult diagnosis, but use your clinical acumen, don't go hunting for rare diseases unless the patient warrants it. If you're not missing some diagnoses, you're working up too many people. Thanks for listening. Until next time.